was so madly in love with her girlfriend, Tori Minnick, she would have done just about anything to be with her. But when Tori is murdered in a brutal attack, it seems as though Aaron took her devotion a little too far. Hello and welcome to The Dark Side of Love. I'm your host, Yonk Sloan, author of suspense novels about the dark side of love. And this week I'm putting a spotlight on the case I'm calling I Love You to Death. Born in 1985 in tiny Jerome, Pennsylvania, population 779, about four hours from Philadelphia, Erin Everett's life revolved around her church, school, and sports. Erin's family was very devout in its Christian faith, and though she was shy, as a little girl, Erin immersed herself in her church's activities, including the Hand of Praise Choir, which performed Christian songs in sign language. Petite, dark-haired, and with piercing blue eyes, Erin also enjoyed playing sports, including softball and basketball. Despite being involved in sports and her church activities, Erin was known to be painfully shy and awkward. According to what attorney Britt Peck told Snapped, despite being a great athlete, because of how bashful Erin was, she was, quote, too timid to shoot the ball when on the court during basketball games. Another aspect of school and social life that Erin struggled with was that she didn't have a lot of friends and, in particular, found it difficult to connect with girls. Her mom, Patty, told Snap that between her daughter's freshman and sophomore years of high school, Erin discovered what Patty termed as her, quote, obsession with girls, which I take to mean that Erin realized that she liked girls and not boys. Despite the revelation, Jerome is a small town with traditional values. And in addition, with so much of her life centered around her church, Erin decided to tamp down the feelings that she wanted to explore with other girls and instead began to date a boy she met in church, even going so far as getting engaged. However, at the end of the day, Erin couldn't quite go through with it and she broke off the engagement, turning her attention to building her career as a certified nursing assistant eventually landing a job at Simmons Lakeview Manor Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. By the time Erin was 24, she was living at home, she was single, and she was finally ready to explore the feelings for other women that she'd had since high school. In particular, she wanted to explore the attraction she felt for fellow co-worker Tori Minnick. Tori Elizabeth Minnick was born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania on February 2, 1990. She graduated from Myersdale Area High School in 2008 and went on to Allegheny Community College for a nursing degree. Like Erin, she was a CNA and an athlete. However, where Erin was painfully shy, Tori was known to be an extrovert who made friends easily. She also had a boyfriend throughout high school named Cody Donaldson and, like Erin, had even become engaged, though upon graduation, the couple found themselves going in opposite directions in their lives and broke up. Erin was immediately smitten with the bubbly, outgoing Tori, but of course, her shyness and inexperience prohibited her from asking Tori out. Instead, she sent her a text message to ask if she'd ever be interested in dating a girl. When Tori was agreeable, an over-the-moon Erin asked her out for dinner. The two really hit it off, and it wasn't long before the friendship bloomed into full-fledged romance. Erin was completely besotted with Tori, so much so she asked her parents if Tori could move into the basement apartment of the Everett home where Erin was living. According to what Patty, that's Erin's mom, told Snapped, Tori was introduced to her as a friend, not a girlfriend, so she was under the impression that the two girls would be roommates, not a couple. However, it quickly became clear that Erin and Tori were definitely in a physical relationship and as Patty told Snap, she was so upset by the revelation that she kicked Tori out of the house. She had a change of heart upon realizing just how deep her daughter's feelings were for Tori, and fearful that she might alienate Aaron by banning her from seeing Tori, she decided to allow her to stay. While it seemed like Aaron's parents were accepting of the relationship, Tori didn't feel comfortable hanging out at the house without Aaron being there. So on the weekends when Erin would be working at the nursing home, Tori would spend that time with her family. Interestingly enough, while Erin was out with her conservative parents, Tori never clued her own family in on the romantic relationship with Erin. 
And while Erin may have been open with her parents about her feelings for Tori, she wasn't quite ready to take the step of being out in her small community, particularly the church she'd grown up in, and so as a result, she pulled back from her involvement with the congregation. In Erin's eyes, Tori was worth it, believing the two of them were destined to be together forever. She even proposed to Tori, who accepted. March 25th, 2011. It's early afternoon. Patty, Aaron's mom, is headed to church for a luncheon when she gets a phone call from Aaron who tells her there's been a break-in, a home invasion, and that she and Tori have been beaten by a masked intruder. This is beyond unsettling because Jerome is a small town and things like home invasions don't happen in a town like this. Aaron's parents race home to find the hysterical Aaron covered in blood. In fact, there's blood everywhere. Patty heads into the house to find a nude Tori at the bottom of the basement steps. Her face is covered with a bloody blanket. Patty was on the phone with 911 who instructed her to perform CPR. However, when Patty checked Tori's pulse, there was no need. She was dead. Tori Minnick was 21 years old. Tori had been shot twice in the head and bludgeoned with a hammer. Tori being bludgeoned raised an antenna with investigators because that indicated something of a personal nature and that perhaps Tori knew her killer. Erin herself was pretty banged up after being assaulted by the intruder. She tells police that she and Tori had worked late at the nursing home and were sleeping in when the sound of breaking glass woke her up. All of a sudden, a guy in a ski mask, black clothes, black gloves, burst into the basement. He pulled out a gun and told Tori, quote, if I can't have you, then nobody will, before shooting her in the ensuing struggle. Aaron said she and the intruder fought before he pushed her down, which allowed her to escape upstairs and hide with her cell phone so she could call for help. And then Aaron tells police she knows exactly who attacked them and killed Tori. She says it was Tori's ex-boyfriend, Cody Donaldson. State troopers raced to Cody's job to arrest him for Tori's murder. And during his interrogation, Cody has a little bomb to drop. He and Tori were, in fact, back together, and were even looking at apartments together. And all those weekends that Tori was spending with her family while Aaron was at work, she was with Cody, rekindling their romance. He, for his part, knew nothing about Tori's relationship with Aaron because she had told him that they were roommates. Well, now this points police back in Aaron's direction and the crime scene. And as cops look closer, they start to realize that some things at the crime scene don't add up. Namely, the broken glass from the front door. And this, I'm telling you, this one has fouled up more people than I can say, but Aaron said that someone broke the window from the front door in order to get in, which means the glass shards would have been inside the house. Except the glass shards were outside, meaning someone broke the window from inside the house, not outside the house. Again, this has fouled up more people um, over the years than we'd be, all, we'd be here all day trying to count how many times that's fouled up somebody. Um, but at any rate, cops also learn that Cody, who Aaron fingered for the attack, has a rock-solid alibi. So the cops say, okay, we need to find out what's really going on, and to do that, they have to take a run at Aaron to get the real story about what happened. At first, Aaron is as cool as a cucumber and does not budge from her story. Masked intruder, shot Tori, beat me up. Aaron tells the police that her relationship with Tori was great, no problems whatsoever, that the two were deeply in love. Finally, the cops say, look, what you said happened is not what happened, so start talking, tell us what really went down, and let's begin with, where'd you get the gun? Aaron can see that the writing is on the wall, and she cracks. She admits that she learned that Tori and her ex-boyfriend Cody had gotten back together and were having a sexual relationship. According to Aaron, as Tori slept, she sat at the edge of the bed 
watching her sleep, thinking about how much she loved her, and if she couldn't have her, then nobody could. Her mind made up, she went upstairs and unlocked the gun cabinet, withdrawing a 357 Magnum. She loaded the gun, went back downstairs, and shot Tori twice in the head. Erin said that as she shot Tori, she was, quote, thinking about how much I wanted to be with her. The two gunshots did not kill Tori. Erin said that Tori continued, quote, gurgling and moaning, and that she, quote, felt bad, and so she hit her twice with a claw hammer until she stopped. Erin said initially she wanted to put the body in the trunk of Tori's car, but that she couldn't get the body up the stairs. So on the fly, she concocted this masked intruder uh, break-in story. And then, Erin drops a little bombshell about an ace that she has in her pocket. Someone who could help her move the body, and that in fact, she'd had this fear for some time that Tori was going to leave her for Cody, and that she and this friend had texted about it, and the friend sent her a text message basically saying, if you ever do shoot her, meaning Tori, I'll help you get rid of the body. Now, what the hell kind of friend is this? Um, for the record, friends of mine, I am helping you do jack about moving a body, so don't call me. Uh, I won't answer. Erin shares that it was her friend, Billy Mayer, who had offered to help her get rid of Tori's body if it ever came to that. So cops bring him in, and at first he's like, look, my name is Les, I am in this mess. Well, of course, cops can't take his word for it, so they ask to take a look at his text messages, and he says, sure, no problem. Oh, but wait, I just deleted all of my text messages, which that's not suspicious at all. Not even a little. Word to the wise kids, even if you delete your text messages, they are still recoverable. Just like the internet is forever, so are text messages. So the cops are able to retrieve Billy's deleted text messages, and surprise, Billy did in fact give Aaron explicit instructions about how to load and fire a handgun. Now, why on earth would Billy do any of this? Well, it's a simple story, really. Billy, you see, had a huge crush on Aaron, and in his warped line of thinking, he thought he could use the situation to his advantage, namely by blackmailing Aaron into sex, believing somehow that in exchange for him providing her with this information about how to shoot somebody, basically, that she would do things like send him naked pictures of herself or whatever. I don't know. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, Billy's text messages turn out to be quite the treasure trove. He was egging her on for weeks about whether or not she had shot Tori and asked her things like, quote, did you do it? Did you do it? And hey, send me some pictures afterwards, because why not? Now, Billy claims that he did not think that Aaron was actually serious about killing Tori, but cops say, sure, Jan, and charge him with conspiracy to commit homicide. Armed with this stunning information, authorities go back to Aaron and say, okay, we've got you. Plead guilty to first-degree murder. Now, in Pennsylvania, first-degree murder means life in prison, no possibility of parole. Aaron decides to take a gamble and elects for a non-jury trial. Remember that this is a small town, a conservative, church-going community where a jury of Aaron's peers might not be comfortable with the details of a lesbian relationship, whereas a judge might be a little bit more open-minded. Erin's trial started on November 12, 2014, and part of her defense is that this was a crime of passion and not premeditated. A crime of passion would be more like manslaughter, which carries a lighter sentence. The problem with that defense, in this case, is that Erin was texting with Billy Mayer about killing Tori beforehand, so that kind of wipes out that crime of passion, came over me, I didn't know what I was doing, um, theory. Erin also says that she was a victim of domestic abuse at Tori's hands. Cody Donaldson, Tori's ex-boyfriend, he says that Tori was not like that and would never do anything like that. Now, while there isn't any evidence like police reports or things like that, you know, remember, victims do not always report abuse. 
Aaron's mom, Patty, testified that she heard them arguing about Cody in the weeks leading up to the murder and that she witnessed one time where Tori had Aaron in a chokehold, but that Tori kind of laughed it off as though they were just messing around. Aaron testified in her own defense and said that, quote, Tori made her feel free to be herself, claiming the relationship was wonderful until the Christmas before Tori's murder, saying that when the verb, that is when the verbal, physical, and sexual abuse began. Aaron said that Tori hit her with a rolled up newspaper that was wrapped in duct tape, would kick her, and that once Tori had sexually assaulted her and later wrote her a letter of apology. Patty told Snapped about her daughter, quote, she just loved her so much. She was willing to overlook the abuse just to have her there. And that finding out about Tori's reignited relationship with Cody sent Aaron over the edge. Another little twist in this saga is Billy Mayer. Aaron essentially says that he was pressing her so much to just do it already. Kill her. That she caved into her feelings of misery and being heartbroken over Tori that she did indeed just kill her. Despite pleas from her defense team to show mercy to Aaron, to take into account the abuse they say she suffered because of Tori, and find her guilty of third-degree murder, which carried a maximum 20-year sentence, those arguments did not sway the judge. And on November 14, 2014, Judge D. Gregory Geary found Aaron guilty of first-degree murder, which again meant life without parole. The judge noted that, quote, love, jealousy, and betrayal are powerful emotions. However, even as powerful as those emotions are, they cannot serve as a basis for mercy. Erin was sentenced to the Pennsylvania State Women's Prison where she returned to her religious faith. Billy Mayer pled guilty to obstruction of justice and criminal use of a communications facility, receiving two years of probation. Erin appealed her sentence, attempting to get it overturned, but in 2016, her term was upheld and she must continue serving her life sentence. One of Aaron's attorneys, Mariah Balling Peck, told Snapped that despite everything, Aaron still misses Tori, saying, quote, she's going to love her till the day she dies. Cody Donaldson doesn't buy it, telling Snapped, quote, I don't know why you would do something like that if you love someone. It was selfish. I hope you enjoyed this Dark Side of Love episode, Women Who Kill. I'm your host, Bianca Sloan, and show your love for the Dark Side of Love by visiting thedarksideoflove.com for show notes and transcripts. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to be notified about new episodes, and you can also find a link to my Patreon page where you can access bonus material and other fun stuff. Learn more about my suspense novels about the Dark Side of Love by visiting biancasloan.com. Thanks for hanging out with me and join me next time for another tale of love gone wrong. I'll see you on the dark side.